Perfect. That's so cool. And I have this little pointer thing. I can switch pages. Cool. Very good. Awesome. I think I'm ready whenever there are enough folks. All right. I think it technically starts at 2.20. Oh, OK, so good. Give them a couple minutes. Sure. <clears throat> Have you been hosting other workshops, Ada? No, this is my first one. <laughs> oh, okay. Good. Well, good luck to both of us, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so far, so good. Do you work with the trustees or are you a volunteer or? I'm a volunteer, yeah. I'd done the Master Urban Gardener with Michelle a few years oh, ago. Oh, you did? Yep. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, I've probably met you then at some point, maybe down at City Natives or somewhere. Could be. Do you have any pointers for me, Ada? Not, not really. I mean, I, um, I guess I'll stop you if we get questions in the chat. Um, okay. And it looks like I can point with my with, with my screen. I wonder that's yeah. big enough, right? Yeah. 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 No, that looks good. Um, Those are the eyes. <laughs> Those are the wings. Nice. And it's been nice having you today. Do you want to get started? I think I've just submitted a few more people, so we might be at a good. I see Jen. Hi, Jen. Hello. How are you? Good. Doing great. What a beautiful day.
Okay. Um, so yeah, Ada, can we should get starting? I think so. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, welcome everyone. Um, boy, what a fitting day to talk about bees. Um, I, I think since about 11 o'clock this morning, I've seen hundreds of bees already sort of foraging around the neighborhood and looking for whatever they can find. I think this early in the year, it's, there are a few, what do they call them, the ephemerals, the, the early rising uh, flowers, like the trilliums and things like that, that the bees are looking for. But pretty soon the maples will be probably producing. And, um, <clears throat> and then it just, they, it just sort of explodes from there. So, so um, I'm gonna lead you through a, a crash course in, um, in beekeeping. And uh, this is by no means all you really need to get going. Um, uh, but um, uh, so I would advise you if you can, uh, if you're really thinking about beekeeping this year um, to, to get started very quickly, um, if you're planning to, to, um, to purchase bees uh, and you don't know where you're getting them from yet, uh, now would be a good time to order them um, because most people are selling out, including myself. Um, and, um, and the equipment and things like that you can get a little bit later. Um, I, I guess, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Bill Perkins. Uh, I am the, uh, the owner of this little shop here, Agricultural Hall. Uh, in, uh, in the Stony Brook neighborhood of Jamaica Plain. Uh, I, um, uh, I like to think of Agricultural Hall as a resource center where people can find uh, resources and supplies that they need to explore uh, the many facets of agriculture in an urban area, except for gardening, because there are a lot of gardening centers out there and places where you can procure that stuff. So I'm, I'm sort of the the odd place. So I have a lot of beekeeping supplies. I sell bees. I have chicken feed at any given time. And um, I can get chicks for you starting pretty soon. Uh, I can tell you where to get them. Uh, we do apple cider pressing in the fall. We do mushroom log uh, inoculations, uh, the whole host of things. So um, there's a lot you can do in the city. And, and uh, um, and Agricultural Hall hopefully is a good place where you can start that journey. Okay, so um, most of what I do here is is uh, beekeeping. Um, I, uh, I have probably 150 customers from year to year, uh, of something like 400 over several years. So um, uh, it's a great place to come and hang out if that's if, if beekeeping is really what you uh, what what you want to explore or what you want to continue to, to do because um, uh, it's kind of a, a, a grange, if you will. It's kind of a place where you can come and hang out and talk to other people who are interested in beekeeping uh, in better times, uh, really not so much right now. Although um, I think a lot of us are outside, uh, you know, an hour to a day instead of being uh, uh, sort of sequestered in our houses. Um, so it, it uh, in a lovely way, it kind of forces you to get outside especially this time of year. So anyway, um, this, is, uh, this is our, um, uh, our, our um, agenda for today. We're gonna talk some about the bee, get you a little bit familiar with the bee, the, uh, the, the, uh, the origins, uh, the, the physiology of the bee. And then we're gonna talk about the beehives and the equipment. Uh, and then we'll talk about month to month maintenance of your hive. Uh, a little bit about products of the hive um, and, um, and uh, perhaps something about diseases. Uh, I, I think I have this that in here somewhere. And then, uh, um, and then part five I have here is how to get closer to bees. Well, I mean, just, uh, you know, there's a Boston Area Beekeeping Association. Uh, that's a good group to sort of latch on to and you'll definitely get closer to bees that way. There are beehives out at the Boston Nature Center uh, and uh, all summer long in, in good times and probably again this summer, we have uh, workshops every Saturday morning where you can come in and put on a jacket and get right into the beehives with uh, some of the 
beekeepers who keep uh, beehives in that apiary. So I, I you know, give me a call, uh, join the Boston area beekeepers. Uh, that takes care of part five. So anyway, let's journey into the bee. Be but before that, sorry, um, a little bit of a glossary. And um, I don't expect you to remember all this, but a beak is a beekeeper. Brood is a pre-adult bee. So anything that's egg, larvae, pupa, ELP, right? Uh, box, I might use the word, oh, I throw one box on top of another box. A box is the, the, uh, the, the hive body itself. And they come in different shapes and sizes. And then we'll talk about that. Cells are those hexagonal um, holes that are in the comb, which is wax that the bees have formed into thousands of hexagons per side of a frame. A frame being the, uh, I'm gonna jump ahead, a frame is a rectangular support that the bees build everything in. Um, here's one that doesn't have anything in it, but you'll see pictures of some uh, soon. I didn't hold that very still, so there's a frame. Okay, uh, back up, uh, drone is a male bee, uh, and, uh, and then nuke is a nucleus, uh, it's sort of half of a beehive um, and uh, it has everything in it. It's, it's a small organized uh, uh, colony that um, you can be sold uh, or transported to put in another beehive and um, into a larger box or hive body that can then expand and fill that out with, uh, with more brood and with honey and other stores. Propolis is glue, sticky glue. Um, lovely smelling stuff. Um, robbing has a tendency for bees to steal from one another and swarming, we'll get into that. It's basically reproduction, bee reproduction. They take off, you know, half of the beehive takes off, um, but leaves um, enough behind to continue to maintain the original parent hive. Um, Ada, <clears throat> will you, um, if people are asking questions, uh, should we hold them to the end or would you just raise your hand and I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. take questions as we go. I think if people put them in the chat, I'm happy to, um, you know, pause you at a good moment and, and read them out. Great. Okay. Yeah. Just wave your hand a little and I'll see you. Great. Um, so quickly, why are bees so important? Because they pollinate. They, um, they according to this, chart and there might be a certain amount of hyperbole, but um, it, it's uh, no uh, exaggeration to say that without bees, uh, we would be in dire straits. Um, bees uh, pollinate a phenomenal amount of the food we eat, uh, the, the flowers of the, that develop into the food we eat. Not the grains, obviously, um, not corn and things like that, but, but, um, but all, most, most all of your veggies and the things we love most, the fruits and the veggies, the yummy stuff. Um, and because of that, there are pollinators like these guys here who load thousands of beehives onto trucks and move them from place to place. And right now, right, right at this moment, there, there are a million beehives either in California or on their way to California, some from the Northeast to put into these, um, these uh, uh, orchards of, um, of almonds. Uh, almond orchards take up about 2 million square acres in California and they need a million beehives. So um, everybody's headed there now. And, um, and then once they're done that, um, once they're done over here, they might move north and uh, help pollinate the apples, the cranberries and things like that. Um, maybe this is the Western group over here, but as I said, some of the people, some of your pollinators will be coming from the East, uh, in the East Coast. Uh, there's a big group uh, from Florida and, and, uh, and Louisiana that work the sort of the East and Northeast. So um, they, they progress, they, they sort of move up um, in, into the Northeast as needed. Um, or, or as crops ripen, they, they sort of move up as to follow the ripening of the, of, or the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the flowering of the crops. Um, this picture here in the bottom 
right hand corner was taken by a friend of mine at Beverly Bees, Anita Delian. If you're familiar with uh, the southeast eastern portion of Massachusetts, you'll recognize those fields in the back. Those are cranberry bogs, and um, and and thousands and thousands of hives are brought into Massachusetts to uh, to pollinate the cranberries. So, um, so these are the products of the hive. I'll just show you briefly, but um, uh, none of uh, none of uh, none of these show the importance of of. of I mean, none of these show pollination, but pollination is really the main reason. But these are the other reasons why we keep bees. Um, okay, we'll talk a little bit about bees. But before we do, I wanna make something clear. Um, not all flying insects that look like bees are bees. Um, there are a lot of hun uh, over a hundred species of native bees just in Massachusetts. And these are, these are bees that have evolved here. Honeybees came from Europe and Asia. They did not evolve here. They are naturalized here now. And who knows what kinds of natural bees they might have pushed out of the ecosystem, but they're here now and they serve a purpose. But there are uh, you know, hundreds of, or, or dozens and dozens of species of native bees that are really, really key in terms of the ecosystem. And without them, they, they pollinate so much more, so much more efficiently than honeybees do that, you know, if you take them away, a lot of the native species wouldn't really be, wouldn't be able to perpetuate their populations. So um, there's a little native bee here, it's a cute one in the upper left. And we all are familiar with the one in the middle there, a bumblebee or a, a wood, um, a, a wood borer, gosh, I forget now what they call them, but um, that's a native bee. Uh, and then on the lower right, there's a cute little native bee as well, covered in pollen, as is the one in the upper right, upper left. Um, and then here's a tricky one here, right up above it. Um, uh, you have a, a honeybee, which is a true bee, and a yellow jacket. And they do sort of look alike, especially their size. So hornets and wasps are not bees. Bees are vegetarian. Hornets and wasps uh, eat, they're omnivores, right? They eat, um, Sort of anything they can get, and um, and and you might know that from trying to eat a tuna fish sandwich during a picnic. You'll have yellow jackets all over you. Um, they love meat, and they take it back and feed it as protein to their developing larvae. Um, honeybees do not. They collect what you see right there, pollen. Right, they're covered in it, and that has a lot of protein in it as well. They gather that up, take it back to their hive fill it, you know, mix it with a little bit of honey that they collect and put it into the, the cell with the larvae in it. So that's really the difference. Hornets and wasps are omnivores and they love meat. And they're very important too because they eat a lot of caterpillars and uh, pests, right? So uh, the bald-faced hornet, uh, you know, you might see them around your garden. They're looking not so much to pollinate anything, they're really looking for caterpillars and, and, um, and, and other insects that, that um, they can carry away. They sting them, which kind of uh, preserves them without killing them. They shove them in the cell and it's sort of like room temperature refrigeration. It's pretty gross, but pretty cool too. Um, all right. Okay, honeybee biology and life cycle. It's it's um, it's it's very cool, but it's also really important because if you know the life cycle of a bee, you can kind of tell what's going on in the hive, right? One hive will have just one queen. You can only have one queen at a time, and up to sixty thousand honeybees. So um, it gets a little crowded in there, so you have to really be looking carefully. Uh, the three types of bees you'll find in the hive are the worker bee. They're all females. Um, and they're the vast majority of the bees in the hive. They're the ones that you've seen pollinating flowers. Um, they don't live that long in the summer, but they live a long time in the winter, which is pretty cool. Um, they do different work based on their age. These are some of the things they do. They clean, they nurse the developing bees, they guard, they forage. There is even one that's an undertaker that takes dead bees out. So they, they I've counted, like I, 
like 20 something different tasks, but um, probably more than that. And that raises an interesting point. Just the other day, I saw a scientist talking about, musing about bees and how smart they were because somebody asked them, what do you think is the smartest insect of all? And it's sort of a silly question, but in a way it's kind of cool to pursue it. And he came up with a bee because it's got so many different things going on. It's social, right? Um, and, uh, and there are lots of tasks involved um, in, in its lifespan. It's not a solitary bee like those native bees we saw that lay their own eggs in their own little hole. They have to socialize, they have to communicate. So anyway, uh, drones, the males. There aren't any drones in the beehives right now. Not, I'd be very surprised if you found any, but there will be very soon because in the winter time, drones would do nothing but eat resources and starve the hive. And so what happens in the fall, they kick all the, the males out and clean the hive. But in the, around this time of year, they're starting to make drones because drones do have a purpose and that is procreation. Right. So they, they make a lot of these drones and pump them out and hope that they fertilize a female that might be passing by and um, in, these, in these congregation areas. And that's, you know, it's all about spreading the genes. So, and then the queen, the one in the middle there. So she wants, might find a second queen and a hive, but they, they don't, coexist for very long. Usually they kill each other or there might be one getting ready to, to leave the hive with some of the, um, the worker bees to start a new hive somewhere else to, to swarm, right? Um, and it's her pheromones that rule the hive. So when, when she emits a smell, um, it's a trigger for the other bees, so. Um, so here's a picture of, of a you know, fairly typical frame and it has a queen on it. And this particular queen is marked. We, we mark our queens because it makes it a lot easier to see her. And maybe some of you have spotted her already because she's pretty close to the center. And you can also see, I'm gonna use my pointer. Well, here, there you go. You can also see sort of a ring of bees around her facing her. That's not always the case, but anyway you can see how dense it is and how hard it is to see her. So that's why we use a marking, but. Um, the, um, the, the typical development is that the queen lays an egg, three days later it hatches into a larvae. Um, that's that larvae there uh, says day six, cause it's already a little developed. Uh, day 10, it's getting pretty large and then uh, pupates at about day 15 and by 21 it's out. And, and this is also important to know, it's, it's important to familiarize yourself with this because you know, if, you, if all you see is maybe a larvae on day 10 and no eggs, then you know that the queen might be having problems and you might have to think about, um, about changing your queen or something. So, so th that's just one example of what, you know, how, how familiarizing yourself with the, 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 the um, the life cycles and the physiology of a bee can help you determine how healthy a hive is. And, and let me just say uh, right here that in the early 1900s, they say that about 90% of hives would overwinter on their own from year to year. That you could collect some honey, close up the hive, maybe winterize it a little bit, wrap it or something like that, and then come back in the spring and 90% of the bees would still be there. And nowadays, um, it's about 60%. And that's when you're being pretty um, pro proactive about helping the hive and treating it. Um, if you don't, uh, it might be closer to 20%, really, um, that 80% that of them die from year to year without any intervention at all. And, and it's a, almost exclusively because of a mite that's been introduced into the United States and throughout the world. Uh, that lived originally on the Asian honeybee, which is a different species. So basically this mite um, uh, jumped a species and uh, the species that it jumped to, or Apis mellifera, has no um, protection, no sort of uh, genetic predisposition to groom themselves or to be hygienic or, 
or to rip out these hives or groom each other. So, um, but anyway, so I just wanted to get that out there because uh, beekeeping is a lot different these days. So, um, and it's because of mites in most cases. Okay, so we learned a little bit about the, the, the bees themselves, the life cycle. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about comb because without comb, the bees can't really do anything, right? It's where they, they as we all know, it's where they store their, their, um, their honey and it's where they, the queen lays the egg as we saw in a, in a previous picture and, um, and, the, and the brood develops, right? Um, and, uh, and it's also where they store the pollen as well. Um, they make wax from, they synthesize it from the sugars, right? So um, I, I, uh, the um, wax is basically a hydrocarbon and I guess in a, in a way uh, sugar is, right? It's, a, it's carbon and hydrogen and, and um, it's just a more simple form of it. But, but they, uh, they synthesize it in these glands that are, um, that are in their abdomen and then they extrude them, especially early in the spring, early to mid spring. Um, late spring, summer, you can't get bees to, to make wax, but they, they just are, are um, uh, with so much nectar out there and it being the building season and the swarming season uh, and the repair season and all that in the early, early mid spring, they're pumping out wax like crazy. Um, this, I, I put in this picture in the upper right just because it looked cool. I hadn't noticed, I, I had no idea, but that's a native bee making wax as well. And it looks, you know, very similar. So um, just kind of curious, but this thing at the bottom here is kind of cool. So once they, um, that's a frame and it's a frame that the bees are filling with honeycomb, right? So um, so maybe a week ago or even just a few days ago, it didn't have any honeycomb. M maybe somebody had just put it in the beehive. And, um, and let's see, so it's like this. There, you, this is your frame, right? If it, I'm looking, it, I'm, uh, I'm showing you in the picture that you can see of me, hopefully. And, um, and it's turned this way. And this, that frame and this frame here are wired, right? To give the comb some strength once the bees build on it. But, and that's what that string is, that, that wire across. But, so what's happening is the bees are building from the top down and you can see they're sort of hanging off one another. And they do that, um, it's called festooning. And they do that because um, by festooning, they're, they're making a plumb line, basically, like a mason would do, right? They, they have a little weight on the end of a string and they hold it and it tells them where straight up and down is. And the bees want to build straight up and down because that makes the comb the strongest, the most stable, right? So that's why it's also important that your beehive be level and not crooked. You know, if you, if you, if you set up your beehive and and your frame is slightly crooked like that, the bees are gonna build the, the honeycomb outside of the frame. So that's something that we always try to remember to tell people anyway. But festooning is a really a beautiful thing and you'll see bees doing that as they build. Um, and when they're done, and these are examples of what it looks like, the, the comb, uh, this one in the top here um, doesn't have a frame around it. Um, it's probably from a different kind of beehive, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but it's such a beautiful picture because um, this is a classic look for a, a, for, for a frame or for, a, an, for, for comb that's been built by the bees. Along the top, you'll have, whoops, sorry. Along the top, you'll have honey. Um, and they build sort of a dome of honey over themselves, primarily because, you know, honey arises. So if you have a dome, covering you and you're underneath it, you can sort of help keep the, keep the heat in. And then the brood will be below that. And, um, and then there'll be a little bit of pollen on the sides. And uh, this is a little spotty, but it's not bad. And there's brood even out to the right and left. But um, so, so on the spring, there's everything. There's a little pollen, there's honey. And, um, and, and that's what you need to make the bees, which are developing in the middle, right? Over here on the left side, you'll see these puffy cells. That, those are males, drones, and we'll talk about that again, or we'll see another picture of that. Um, if you were to zoom in on that, that good looking brood right in the middle, that capped brood, you would see this picture here on the, on the bottom right, bottom left, sorry. And this is a honey frame from a different beehive on the right. So you can see 
the comparison of the colors there. Um, a lot of people when they're first starting out, they, they get confused. It, it's, it, you know, for once you've seen it, you know it, you, you'll be able to tell the difference, but it's, it looks, um, it's, it's a little tricky at first, but there's honey on the bottom right, brood on the bottom left. Um, I put this in here because, because um, as bees set up their beehive, again, they put that dome of honey over themselves. And then those, the, the bottom is where the queen um, typically stays through the summer to that's sort of the engine of the hive. That's where the brood is being laid. Um, and the, most of the pollen gets stored there as well. And the honey is, um, is really put up above. Now, I should say that honey is, is a carbohydrate, right? It's great for energy, but it's, it's not good for building our bodies, right? If we just ate honey, we would be, um, It'd be like drinking coffee constantly, we, and we'd be a mess before too long. But um, but adult bees don't eat pollen, or incidentally, they eat little bits of it. But uh, for the most part, they need nothing but carbohydrates. And if they're in there for six months or eight months, and there's no food anywhere, they need food, right? They need a food store. So that's what the honey is for. That's why bees collect honey, because they're getting ready for the, the coming dearth. dearth sorry, the, the coming cold, the coming dry season, whatever it might be. Um, and so typically, again, down below, let's look at the box on the upper left. These two boxes down here are the brood boxes, the deep, deep boxes. Not all beekeepers do it this way, but um, these, uh, the, the bees are probably, well, I would guess they're right in here, but the next box up has, uh, that's a honey super. It's superimposed on the other boxes. So they, we call them supers or honey supers. And then the one up above that uh, is probably a honey super or it might be a quilt box, sort of like a, a um, we sometimes will fill our boxes with wood shavings and things like that to let them breathe, but keep them warm at the same time. So if you look down at the bottom left, that same hive you would take, uh, there's a picture taken by Maureen Coelho. She's a co president of the Boston Beekeepers Association. This is the Boston Nature Center. And she, uh, she took this picture and it, it's uh, infrared. And you can see that the bees are indeed, uh, looks like they're in that, uh, um, in that dark uh, honey super, most of them. Um, and they're shimming and shaking, using that honey to, to move, to, to, to move their bodies, right? Um, and basically, basically they just sort of buzz in place um, and and keep themselves warm that way, and they they're constantly sort of trading places, but they're they're in sort of a cluster, and um, and, and they stay pretty tight as long as it's cold. Um, it's incidentally they're on the very far um, uh, far right. I set up a beehive in a nucleus. Right? I talked about that a five frame box. It has uh, it has everything in it that you that the bees need. But in the wintertime, it's just too small. And uh, you can see that there, that it's a little offset, but that yellow line, that yellow glow um, should be over to the left a little more, but the bees were so spread out that that beehive died. So I'll never do that again. Um, so um, just real quickly, uh, take a look uh, at these little dots in the upper left. There's a dot there, there's a dot there. It's a little weight out there. And we saw this in the drawing earlier. <coughs> Those are eggs. That's how small they are. Oops, sorry. So they look exactly like a grain of rice, but I think they're literally a thousand times smaller. So you can see them, but they are small. Um, next step would be down here, bottom left. Um, these are larvae, just little kind of grubs. You know, if they were um, butterflies, they would be caterpillars. If they were Beetles, they would be grubs. That's the larval stage. Um, upper right, you see this area here that's it's one of these cells, but it, it's been capped. So bees seal up the larvae when they pupate. And the pupa actually, I've been told they spin, they actually spin or form some kind of a cocoon inside there. And each time they do that, it makes the that comb darker and darker. So often the brood comb is jet black. 
whereas honeycomb is nice and yellow. But um, And then the bottom right, you can see a bee emerging there. There are lots of videos about this, and I, uh, I'll try and include them at the very end. Um, so um, here we see the, the timing again. Um, but what's interesting here is, look at the development stage, uh, the development timing for a queen. For those of you who are uh, evolutionary biologists, you might be able to sort of determine why this is. So 16 days for a queen and 24 days for a drone. Well, for the most part, drones are expendable. I mean, you do need them to procreate, but they, they can sit around for a while and, and, and uh, nobody's gonna, um, it's not gonna harm the hive. But if it takes too long for the queen to emerge and start laying eggs, then that could harm the hive a lot. So the, the queen's development is sped up quite a bit. Um, this is the video, so I'd love to show it to you. But anyway, there's a beautiful picture of an egg right below the right, right, uh, right here. That's that's gorgeous. It's still standing upright, and then it tips over, and then it forms into a larvae. And anyway, um, one more uh, uh, look at brood. Um, let's see. Okay, um, this is uh, upper left beautiful brood. Um, the shading on this is a little weird, but. Gorgeous brood. There's a little drone brood there. They need the males to spread the genes, but they also need all these workers to keep the hive alive and expanding. And then that dome of honey, see it's sort of up and over to right and left. Um, if you look at the, this picture down here, is another, um, another way of telling if your hive um, needs attention. Um, there's a very spotty brood pattern. You see um, some cells here, gosh, I, I have trouble using the pointer. There's a bunch of cells here that are capped. Those are, that's future brood. I mean, that's future workers. But then you see a lot of cells that have something shiny in them. And that's, in some cases, that's pollen. But in most cases, like up here, that's nectar. And they're, the bees are starved for a place. They're, they're bringing in a lot of nectar, but they have no place to put it. And so they'll put it anywhere they can. And then the queen has trouble finding a place to lay her eggs. So this is called a honey bound frame or a honey bound hive. And you don't want that because the queen can't lay eggs and then your population is gonna diminish. So if you pull up a frame and you see that, it probably means you need to add a box or two to give them more room to expand the hive. If you don't do that, you're gonna get something, you're gonna, you're gonna get swarming, right? Which is when the bees say, oh, there's no more room here or everything's fine. Everything's hunky-dory. It's time to start a new, a new family, basically. And, instead, and unlike us, the, uh, the parent, the, the queen will leave the hive with sometimes up to half of the bees and start a new colony somewhere else. She leaves behind a developing queen who then takes over egg laying and, and control of the hive. Um, Right here, upper right, you see a couple of cells now. Uh, yeah, sorry. That is the very bottom of a frame. So if you can see me again, um, that uh, those little holes there um, right here are at the bottom of the frame and they're pointing straight down, right? As is the one on the lower uh, right as well. Um, they make a lot of those anyway, the, the ones in the upper right, but when you see it like in the lower right, then they're actually making a queen. So they'll have a lot of those ones in the upper right just hanging around in case the queen has an urge to lay an egg and start a new family, start a new, and get ready to swarm. And if you see in the lower right, that's a swarm cell or a queen cell, and that means it's getting close to time. So. Um, one more thing about brood pattern, this on the lower left, you might know by now, you've seen a couple of examples already, but those are all drones there. All those cells are drones. And what's happened is that the queen is either not fertile that's in the hive or she's died. And the workers in, a, in the last ditch effort to spread their genes will elect one or more of the workers to lay eggs. They're all female, right? They can lay eggs, they're just not fertilized eggs. So one of these workers will start laying eggs as many as they can, sometimes 15 in one cell. 
Now only one develops, but they do it. It's an ugly, um, it, it's really ugly because the, they do them on the side, on the top, but they all, you know, one of them takes over and develops and then you get nothing but drones and it's sort of a death spiral at that point. Um, there's very, very hard to correct that. Um, so another way you can tell when your hive is in trouble. Um, so multiple eggs in one cell, like I was saying, that's a lane worker. Spot ear loose brood pattern, we saw that, right? With the honey being filled in, it was a honey bound hive. Um, signs of disease, we'll take a look at that a little later. Uh, but you've seen what good brood looks like. So now you might be able to tell if I showed you a picture of what bad brood looks like. Um, and a queen cell, if you see queen cells, then you have to, um, then you have to take, take action. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, uh, breeds, there are different, different breeds of bees, right? They're not, um, not all bees are the same. Um, I mean, Apis, Apis mellifera has lots of different races, right? Um, and here's a little table that shows uh, some of the most common races of bees. They all have different personalities, uh, different qualities. Um, uh, some are, some love to collect a lot of honey and swarm a lot. That's something you might not want in the city is, is swarming because when they swarm, they might end up in your neighbor's yard or um, I think there's a picture of a swarm. Whoop. No, I don't have it, but, um, or in the middle of a, the, the, you know, graduation ceremony at BU, which happened one year. Um, uh, some of the good uh, overwintering bees uh, that resist Varroa mites uh, might have a high aggressive personality. So um, study up on your bees before you make your selection. Um, so bees are social, and this is, I think, the last thing we'll talk about when we're talking about the physiology and behavior of bees. But um, they uh, they communicate with pheromones, as we talked a little bit about with the queen pheromone. There are other pheromones at work as well. Um, one of the pheromones uh, that signals distress smells a lot like bananas. So if you ever join somebody in an apiary, don't have a banana before you go because it can trigger a sort of a, a, a pissy behavior, if you will. Um, they also communicate by movement. I mean, we probably all know or have heard about the waggle dance that bees do to communicate where their honey is coming from. Um, it's a beautiful, not that complicated uh, dance that um, tells uh, that one bee will use to tell other bees where resources are. Um, and uh, more proof that bees are uh, more complicated, the most, maybe perhaps the most complicated insects there are. Um, okay, so let's get into you and beekeeping. Okay, before you start, know your body, right? Know your, your physical limitations, because a full honey super can weigh up to 80 pounds, right? And, um, and you're going to need to sort of schlep that off of the hive, uh, especially if it's five boxes up, you know, you're, you might have some trouble. So a lot of times uh, people will take some of those frames out one by one and put them in a nuke box and lighten the load and move things around that way. You, you figure it out, but there are different sizes of hives and different types of hives. So if you're, if you're like me, you might want to move to eight frame hives instead of 10 frame hives because I'm getting older and not as strong as I used to be. Uh, know your rights. Uh, in terms of um, keeping bees in Boston, it's still not legal in most neighborhoods. Uh, every neighborhood uh, with a name, basically Dorchester, West Roxbury, they all have to go through this uh, zoning process to change their zoning tables and nobody has yet because it's pretty complicated. Um, but um, even people at the BPDA, I hope none of them are listening, but I, I've heard that people will ring them up and say, well, what, what do we do? We, we want to keep these. And they basically, everybody's kind of okay with it as long as you talk to your neighbors. So, um, I've heard of lots of people getting their chickens taken away, which is unfortunate, um, usually for no good reason, but I haven't heard of anybody having their bees taken away, knock on wood. I am knocking on wood right now. Um, know your space. So bees don't need a whole lot of space. I've seen bees kept uh, in a shed uh, two feet away from a 
five-story building and they have to come out and fly straight up. So, but that's not ideal, right? So uh, I, um, bees love coming out of the hive, flying straight out and then up. So they'll fly out about four or five feet and then they'll start to pick up, pick up uh, their altitude, right? Um, uh, they love to, um, they love to, it's best if you can sort of tip the, or t tilt the, or face the beehive in a easterly or southerly direction because th that way they can get take advantage of early morning sun um, and it gets them up and out and working early. And then um, if they have afternoon sort of dappled shade, that's really great. Um, budget. So I was trying to work this out with uh, somebody earlier today and I forget, I do it every year and then I forget, but it's something like 500 bucks to get everything you need. And that's a pretty complete setup for everything you would need from from bees to equipment to boxes and protective gear and all of that right up to the end of the year. I think that's about right, but don't quote me. And there are some people that do it, you know, that have some equipment for sale and you can always wait and try and catch a swarm, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But so there are ways of doing it for less too. Uh, know your hives, we're gonna talk about that. Know your bees, I've already told you that. Um, and then really know that making mistakes is part of the journey, but, but try not to. I mean, we don't wanna have to keep buying bees from year to year. The most important thing is that you, in the, you, you keep the mic the day, right? That's the most important thing. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, these are the different beehives. I think there's almost one of every kind here. Um, from left to right, we have a, uh, uh, Langstroth hive, which is the most popular hive invented here in Massachusetts, by the way. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, it was, there were iterations of it before, but this person, uh, Adolf Langstroth, I think was his name, he, he uh, determined that the magic bee space for bees was three eighths of an inch. If they have three eighths of an inch, they can pass through very easily. You give them any more room and they'll fill it with comb or propolis, right? And they'll gum up everything. Any less and they can't move very easily. So three eighths of an inch is that magic bee space. Langstroth uh, looks like a small one, maybe an eight frame. There's a nuke right there, a little baby nuke. There's a pretty classic setup, two brood boxes and a, and a medium honey super on top. This one looks like an eight frame. I think it is uh, all medium. Some people are doing all mediums as a way of reducing the weight even more. I like having the deep boxes because the queen seems to like consistency, but, um, but, but a lot of people, even some of the best beekeepers I know are going to all mediums. It keeps all the equipment standard. There's a pretty big hive there. Um, now this one here is a war A hive called the People's Hive invented in France. It's a oddball, uh, but fun. And uh, probably less than 1% of the hives in the States are those, but they're really beautiful. Um, and then, uh, and the difference is that the frames don't aren't uh, four-sided; they're just one-sided. So the bees build down, and the comb just hangs from the frame. A lovely little hive. It really mimics the inside of a tree trunk, but to me, it's almost a little too small. And then this one that looks like a cow trough. Um, this one here, that's a top bar hive, or a Kenyan top bar hive. Very popular in Africa. Some form of that. We'll see some of those in a sec. Early hives, this one in the middle and the upper uh, upper center, it just blows my mind. This is fifth uh, cave painting from 15,000 years ago. I checked and that's, it kept coming up as 15,000. So uh, it just blows my mind. Uh, upper or left, bees will do that in very arid climates, but not very common. Uh, lower center, those are skep hives. Uh, they basically in Germany and Europe and places they would encourage bees to uh, build in a hive and at the end of the year they would basically destroy it and take all the honey out. Lower right is uh, a bald faced hornet nest which are quite common around here but not a beehive. Um, upper left uh, France those are chestnut logs with big stones on the top and this one on the lower left is a, in China somewhere. <laughs> There's so much variation and they all blow my mind. Whoops. Um, 
this one in the lower left, see, this is sort of the top bar style. You can see hanging on the lower lower right and lower left. Um, the one in the lower left there with the, uh, the, the uh, caption, that one is pretty cool. They, they're, elephants do not like bees. So the, these people will put uh, hang bees uh, on a fence around a, a garden. And uh, if the elephants trip it, then the bees come out and attack the elephants. <laughs> it's really ingenious. Um, and these are Slovenian hives, which may or may not be more popular here in years, as years come, uh, as we go, as, as we progress. But uh, they're a bit expensive. But basically, as you can see in the lower left picture, um, it's it's basically a like a barn or a shed. And these can be different sizes that are filled with boxes and the bees enter out the front. But you can go inside and like that gentleman in the upper left and, and work your beehive from the inside. Pretty cool. Um, and then we have our most common hives, the Langstroth, upper right, upper left, sorry. There's a picture of that war A hive on the upper right, the, the, uh, the people's hive from France, and then a top bar on the, on the, in the two lower pictures. And you can see the comb as the bees build. Those. So that top bar hive, like the war A, just has a frame that rests on the uh, frame rest and the bees build down on the, from that frame. So you can see uh, 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 how the bees are building the comb in that lower right picture. These are different iterations of the Langstroth and the one on the bottom left is one that you've probably all heard of. It is the, um, the flow hive, right? And, and I am the first one to admit that it's ingenious. It's unbelievably cool. Um, it's just brilliant, uh, brilliantly engineered, simple, but brilliant. And, but, but I really don't like them because um, it, it gives people the false sense of, uh, of, um, of beekeeping as being, uh, is all they have to do is really turn a crank, which is how you get this thing to work. You, you turn a crank and the, the, the comb, uh, if my hands were a single cell of honey, um, the, when you turn that crank, it cracks the comb. It, 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 all of the combs are built in with plastic and um, in, in, in columns and it cracks it and the honey comes out. But you really need to get in the hive. You need to get in there and check it and make sure the is not a problem, the Nocema is not a problem, whatever. So here's a quick look at a Langstroth. We've seen them already. Uh, the bottom board, these are all essential parts. You don't need that stand. Uh, couple of pieces of cinder block would do, but you need a bottom board, a brood box, or, or something that will be your brood box. Again, you could use uh, a super uh, a medium box or a shallow box, um, but, but that's what it looks like uh, sort of on the inside, and that's basically the, the layout. And the, the queen is going to be in the lower section, and the honey is going to be up above. And sometimes she'll move up pretty high, especially in the summertime. She might even move into the very top. So people will use these things here, this thing called a queen excluder. And it's basically, um, it's a, it's a, uh, it's, a uh, it's a barrier, right? That keeps the queen down below. And it's, she cannot pass through these. It's, these are um, strategically placed, these uh, rows here so that the queen can't get through. So she has to do all of her work down below, which makes it more important for you to make sure that she has enough room. So this, if this were midsummer, there would definitely be two of those brood boxes. A um, couple of frames here. It's the upper uh, left, that's a foundation list. So we have these sheets of foundation, um, pieces of wax. Um, uh, like this here, which we slide into a f empty frame, like the the one in the well, the one in the upper left has some wire in it. But we'll we'll take an empty frame and put this foundation in it, and it gives the bees a template for building their comb. It gets them going faster, right? Um, but a lot of people like to do foundationless, like the upper left. There's a little strip of foundation there. It's called a starter strip. It kind of encourages the bees to start right there and build down. Um, that's lovely uh, comb when they build it. It's really the best, um, but it does take more energy, right? And, but ultimately that, th this 
comb here on the lower right, that's honey comb, nice and yellow. Um, that's the end product. That actually uh, upper right, I think is plastic too. And there are, um, so people use plastic. There's, I, I never buy it, but I sort of, actually I do sometimes for other people, but um, here's a piece of plastic with comb that's been built, oops, that's upside down. So this is how it would look in the, if I pulled it up, it looks like they didn't build all the way, right? This is still bare plastic. And if the wax comes off of that, they won't touch it. So I might have to re-wax this, but you'll see something in these cells here, probably pollen. Yeah, it's pollen stores, but there's no nectar. So this was not a, this hive was in trouble. They will, there's not a lot going on here, or maybe I took it out to replace it. All right. Let's see how we're doing for time. Okay, the tools that you'll need, you'll need your bees. We talked about that, the different kinds of bees. You'll need uh, um, your boxes, um, your equipment, and then you'll need um, your the tools that you carry with you to visit the hive. Um, and these are the basic tools you'll need. Um, and um, and uh, I think it, the one that I would think, the, the one that's the most important on this page, you might think is the jacket, maybe the smoker, but it's really the hive tool because you can't do anything. I mean, if I forget my hive tool, I can't do anything in the apiary because I can't get in there to look at the bees. I can't break, I can't even get the top off because bees spread that propolis everywhere. And it really is a glue, it tightens everything. So um, without the hive tool, you might as well just go home. Um, then probably the next most important thing might be the smoker or the veil, depending on what time of year it is. In the, in the spring and summer, early summer, when there's nectar out there, I tell people you could probably be keeping your birthday suit, but, um, but, but I wouldn't advise it. But, but really the bees are so busy that they're not looking at you. They're, they don't even know you're there. Um, so, um, the smoker, the smoker we carry, we only use it when we need, when we, when we're doing like a deep dive and the hive is developed and everything. We wouldn't use it in the very beginning, um, but uh, it, it makes the bees feel as if there's a fire. It's it sort of uh, they, they smell smoke, and where there's smoke, there's fire. If there were a fire, they would be, they would would be it would be the end, right? So what they do is they. They go into the hive, it gives them a purpose. They go into the hive and they gorge on honey, fill their bellies up so that if a fire really does sort of start lapping at the beehive, then they can all fly away with full bellies and they're be, they'll be much able, much more able to start uh, a new colony somewhere else much quicker because they, 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 they have all the honey in their bellies, they can start building wax and set up shop somewhere. So the smoker gives them purpose, right? Gives them something to do instead of stinging. Or, or focusing on me. The notebook in the middle, I highly recommend it. So I would just keep it open when you're working your beehive and then look at it before you go back in. Okay, here we go, month to month. These are some of the things you're getting into, right? Um, so I think, I think this is being recorded so you can go back and look at this later, but you can also find this kind of list online. So um, it's kind of like a, merry-go-round, you know, where, where do you jump on? Do you jump on in December? Do you jump on in midsummer? Let's start in March, because that's kind of when things, that's where we are, and that's kind of when things uh, start popping, start happening. Um, so if you're a, a beekeeper and you already have bees, um, that would be the second part of all these pages. If you're a new beekeeper, um, it would be the first paragraph or the upper part. So if you're getting ready, um, you want to prepare your site, uh, level the ground, uh, hive stand or cinder blocks. Water source is pretty important because if uh, if you're in a neighborhood where your neighbor has a, a bird bath or even a swimming pool and you don't have any water and it's summertime and gets hot, the bees are going to go visit that their water source. They're going to they need water. They need a lot of water. Um, so have a water source nearby. They'll um, They'll start using it before they go to the neighbors. Um, 
right now I'm seeing a lot of action. The, the queen is probably laying a fair amount of brood right now. When pollen starts coming in, and it is, you can see it on the bee's legs already. Uh, when the pollen comes in, it's a trigger for the queen to start laying. So there's probably some brood coming now. There probably aren't any new bees in there. They're probably all at least four or five months old. Um, April, the bees, yay. So, um, so there's a lot of foraging in April. Um, uh, dandelions is great. Uh, and then um, a little bit later, the trees. Oh, oh and there's uh, maples, although I'm not quite clear which ones. Uh, but April's great. Um, and, then, and then May, later on, you get the trees. And the trees are fantastic producers of nectar. That's really where, when the trees start blooming, that's when the boxes really fill up. But anyway. If you're getting bees, they'll come in a package like these boxes you see in the in the lower uh, in the left side here, and each one will have a queen cage in it like this here, suspended in the middle. Uh, you'll have 10,000 bees or, or three pounds of bees in there, and uh, basically you open up your hive that you've prepared. You all the bee all the frames are filled. They might have foundation in them that you put in those strips of wax, whatever. Um, everything's set. You take your bees and you dump them in. And the queen cage, you pull her out, uh, uh, not out of the cage, you, you, you keep her in that cage. That cage has a little, actually, I'll probably find one here. Uh, yeah, so um, here's a queen cage and, um, and uh, let me, there we go. And uh, over here, there's a, a little plug of um, sugar, uh, sort of like a marshmallow and a hole right there drilled in, but it's plugged with a cork and another hole on the other side plugged with a cork. And the thing is that these bees are harvested from lots of different beehives and the queen that's with them is not their queen because they don't want to, the people that raise these bees, they don't want to empty out the hive and then have to start all over again. So they, they have production hives and the queens do nothing but lay eggs and, and produce bees. So they basically when they fill these boxes, these, these packages with bees, they're harvesting worker bees and, uh, and they leave the queen in the hive. Then they have to get a queen from somewhere. So they have nurseries where they raise queens. There's ways of raising hundreds of them at a time. Uh, all you basically need to do is take a cell. If it's pointing down, the worker bees will make a queen out of it. That, it's really that simple. Pointing down like those queen cups that we saw earlier, facing down is, is, a, is a trigger of some sort that makes the workers feed it and develop a queen. They take those queens and they put them in these little cages. And then, um, because if they just drop the queen in that package, they would kill her because she's not their queen. They don't want to raise somebody else's queen, right? They, it's not their genes, not their familiar smell. So they put them in the cage, submerge the cage in with the bees that are being transported from Georgia in most cases to here. And in, the, in about five days, um, those bees will get acclimated to her smell and think that she's their queen. So as long as you keep her in that cage for five days uh, and then let her out, then she's safe. Um, so in April, you're installing your packages um, and then you leave them alone while the queen and them get to know one another. Um, and then at that, after that, you go in, you check to make sure the queen is laying eggs. And if not, then you need to you know, get a hold of me or, or the, the, your supplier and put in another queen. Because the last thing you want is a lane worker hive, like all drones, like we saw earlier, it's a death spiral and there's no way of stopping it. So, so it's, it's touch and go in the very beginning. Um, you have to feed them too. So remember they're, they're, especially if you're just giving them foundation or even foundationless frames, if you don't have any frames that already have all that comb built, um, then they need to they need to take six pounds of honey to make one pound of wax, right? They, there's a lot of synthesis going on, synthesizing of that wax. So um, so what we do is we feed them sugar syrup, and um, and sometimes we put in additives like uh, honey be healthy, which is lemongrass and spearmint. It makes them drink it even faster. But these are various feeding techniques, but um, and we, we just, we mix up sugar, white sugar, domino sugar, 
the whitest sugar you can find and you mix it with um, with water, generally one to one, but I like to do two to one, less work for the bees to two sugar to one water because then the bees don't have to evaporate so much uh, moisture. It's more concentrated and they start synthesizing wax like crazy. And as long as you do that while they're building wax in the brood box and filling that area with honey, you're not, you're not making honey that you'll harvest from those honey supers up above. You're not making that honey with sugar syrup. So in the very beginning, it's okay to feed them sugar. It's, it's really fine. They kind of, you kind of have to. These are really good feeders. I like these a lot. In, they're in the hive. Um, that's resting right on top of the bees, basically. And then May, serious nectar flow, because that's when the locusts, the black black locusts are, are honey locusts, black locusts are, are, are flowering. Lovely flower around here. Um, um, yeah, and the queen is popping out eggs left and right. This is like prime time. Um, um, you have to keep up with their expansion. If you aren't putting on boxes fast enough, then it'll become honey bound and you'll be in trouble. Typically, um, well, um, in June, biggest nectar flow, I don't know. I think the, I think the honey locusts are in like around Memorial Day in May. So, but maybe June is a good one. I don't know. Um, but there's, there's pretty consistent nectar coming from lots of different places between um, sort of uh, when the dandelions flower and, and through uh, the first couple weeks in July, um, which is when you have the linden trees around here blooming. And the lindens are also fantastic nectar producers and the bees love it and it makes great honey. If you live around swampy areas or around the coast, you have different plants and some people who live up like my friend Anita up in Beverly, her bees are bringing in tons of honey even late into the fall because they have swamp plants that are still producing a lot of nectar. Um, inspect every couple of weeks, really it's probably an hour or two a week. Um, yeah, that's about right. Um, so you're gonna have to start looking for signs of swarming even if you put in a new package, they could swarm in the very first year they might say, they might collect a lot of nectar, make a lot of babies and say, yeah, everything's good here. Let's start a new family. So, so let's talk a little bit about swarming. Um, I think we have a few more minutes. Um, well, we do so, have more questions um, in the chat. I don't know if you wanna take those now or keep going. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, uh, let me just buzz through this, uh, no pun intended, but um, yeah, let me just talk a little bit about swarming here quickly and I'll stop in two minutes. Um, so as I've said several times, swarming is when they reproduce, so their, their way of reproducing the queen will leave several developing queens in the hive and then take off when things are looking really good. Uh, there's that picture at BU. So um, uh, you might wanna find a, type of a variety of bee that doesn't tend to swarm a lot, but they all do. I mean, that's how they reproduce. So you really need to keep on top of your bees no matter what kind of variety you have. There, here's some ways of um, keeping on top of things. The seven, 10 rule in the top means if seven frames are filled out and they're busy working those frames, then it's time to add another box, another 10 frames or eight frames. Um, ventilation is good, especially as summer comes on. Um, here's uh, pictures of swarm cells, uh, these long sort of peanut shaped things. Um, when you start seeing these around, um, uh, well, they're these are different kinds. There's, there's swarm cells and then there's supersedure cell. A supersedure is when the bees supersede the queen because she's not producing well. And that could happen almost any time of year. But when you see these things happening, it's time to be very vigilant, right? Um, let's see. Oh yeah, um, well, when you see swarming maybe taking place, time to call your mentor. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Um, you can also, if you see a, a swarm cell forming, you can split your hives. You can 
preempt their swarming by actually taking some of the beehive and putting it in a new beehive. And that way it reduces their, uh, their uh, predisposition to, to, to wanna take off. But the timing has to be right. If that swarm cell is capped, in other words, if that queen is in the pupil stage, the bees are gonna swarm no matter what. You can take all those cells out and kill them, but the queen's gonna leave. And then if you do kill them all, then there won't have to be another queen to take over. Um, so it is a little tricky. Oh, and then here's catching a swarm, which is the most fun thing to do. But um, bees, when you, bees will swarm, you can catch them in a box and put them in a new beehive, sort of the way you put a package in a beehive and start another hive that way. This happens sometimes in April, really, but mostly in May. Memorial Day, a week or two before Memorial Day is swarm season. Um, maybe there's a swarm in the upper lower or upper left there. Um, and then you can bait bees as well. You can put a beehive with comb and a couple of good smelling things in, up in a tree and hope that a beehive, that a colony will, that swarming colony will move in. Uh, yeah, and maybe this would be a good time to take questions. Yep. All right. So um, one question, any tips for attracting and raising solitary bees? Oh yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, the trustees has a workshop, uh, has a lecture. Um, they're sponsoring a lecture with the Boston Area Beekeepers this Thursday by a guy, um, Nick Dorian at Tufts University. He's gonna talk all about native bees. And then two days later on Saturday, I'm gonna do a little workshop here where I can show you how to make a native bee by bee house. But it's very simple. You can take reeds, pieces of bamboo, or even just a piece of wood, um, but those holes have to be the size of a pencil. It's good to have a little variation, but a pencil size is about the optimal size. Bigger attract different bees, smaller attract other kinds of bees. And just jam them into a, into a tin can and hang it on the side of your house. Make sure that they're five inches or more long. So you kind of bundle them all together and stick them in a tin can and hang them on the side of your house and the bees will use them, so. Um, another question. So I think you mentioned some of these, but what are some early spring flowering plants, shrubs and trees that bees can gather pollen from? Right. Um, it's just not something that I spend enough time looking at, but um, um, crocuses right now, somebody said it's uh, kind of an orange pollen. And then um, pretty soon Siberian squill is one. I mean, there are probably two dozen but I know um, there's this beautiful dark blue pollen that comes from Siberian squill and that, that'll start coming in pretty soon. Um, so it's, it's very, it's a lot of fun. The bees only collect pollen from one type of flower as they, as they collect it each time they go out. So um, uh, especially this time of year, you can stand by the beehive and watch the bees come in and their legs have the, you know, the pollen stuck to them and, um, and the different colors coming in are like, you know, it's like fireworks sometimes. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Nice. Um, and then someone asked if you can recommend any beekeeping services for Austin, Boston area residents. So they know someone in Watertown who keeps bees, but as someone else who does the work. Oh, right. I don't know about the one in Watertown. There is um, uh, Best Bees, uh, Boston's Best Bees, or I think they just called the Best Bees Company now. Um, and they're, here in Boston, but I think they're going national. So, um, but um, if you, if you, so a lot of beekeepers are looking for places to put a lot of, you know, backyard beekeepers and non commercial beekeepers are looking for places to put hives. So I would highly recommend sending an email to bostonbeekeepers.org uh, to somebody there, the president perhaps, and just say, look, I, I would love to have bees in my yard, but I don't want to have to keep them. Um, I'm, unless you're pretty far out, I'm pretty sure he, we would be able to match you up with somebody and then you could do it for free. I think Boston Best Bees is in excess of a thousand dollars and I think it might even be more than, a little more than that. So. Cool. All right, um, I'm gonna put in the chat um, some of the trustees. Uh, there's a survey um, and then kind of some signups. Um, in the chat, I think we are at time, um, but 
yeah, I guess if, if there's any last things, Bill, that you want to share or. Um, uh, no, this is, uh, bees tend to beard. It looks like they're swarming, but um, they just are hanging out in the summertime because it gets hot in there. <laughs> Harvesting, it's a lot of fun and you can make a community project out of it. Um, sometimes as you get ready for winter, you might want to combine your hives if they're both weak. Um, let me just show you a disease that I was talking about. Nosema, this is dysentery, this is poop, these little things here. Um, but they're the varroa mites. And you can see on a bee, that's pretty large. It's like the size of a saucer stuck to your back. And they really weaken the hive and they also vector about 20 different diseases. So that's what we're all trying to sort of get around, right? And that's what takes up most of our time when it comes to beekeeping. So there they are feeding on a, feasting on probably a drone uh, pupa. So there are other things too, but anyway, that pretty close to covers it. This is basic now, go out and do some more studying. So. Awesome. Well, and feel free to call me anytime. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Always fun. Enjoy <laughs> spring. Ada, any last words or should I go ahead and log off? I think you can go ahead and log off. Um, All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's been fun. <laughs>